Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 11th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome uh, all uh, members and welcome our witnesses, who I'll come to in a moment, and anyone joining us in the public gallery. And I, can, I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the, uh, the sound equipment. Just before we get into uh, the first session, I'd just like to... Uh, formally record uh, our thanks as a committee to um, our uh, former assistant clerk, Diane Barr, who's now left the committee to go and work for the Non-Government uh, Bills Unit. Diane was with the committee for quite a number of years, and I think we all appreciated her, uh, her efforts and her, her cheerful support for the work of the committee over that time, and I th we wish her all the best in her new role. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, Ilsa Byrne Murdoch, who is uh, not actually here at the moment, <laughs> he was here a second ago. Uh, who is joining us as the new Assistant Clerk from the Equal Opportunities Committee. Right, item one on the agenda. Can I have the committee's agreement that we take item three in private? Is agreed. that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Item two on the agenda. We are taking evidence this morning on the future of marine energy in Scotland. We have a, a large and distinguished panel joining us today. And I think what I would like to do is ask the panel um, just to go around and and introduce themselves, say who they are, uh, who it is that they're here to represent and how they feel that fits into the, the, the very broad picture we have around marine energy. And maybe start with Neil Kermode on my left-hand side and just work along. Neil. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, my name is Neil Kermode. I'm a chartered civil engineer um, and I live up in Orkney, so ignore my accent for a minute. Um, I am the Managing Director of EMEC, which is the European Marine Energy Centre. Uh, we're the world's only testing laboratory, and that also makes us the first, therefore, uh, for full-scale wave and tidal <laughs> energy devices, uh, which are out in the open ocean. Um, we are grid-connected, and um, we are accredited as a laboratory. Um, we were set up by public sector finance, um, and we have been uh, successful in piloting many of the, uh, in fact, practically all of the tests that have gone on for full-scale wave and tidal energy devices in the UK so far. I'll um, be glad to fill in more as you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Stephen Wyatt. I'm the Commercial and Strategy Director for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Uh, Catapult centres are um, a network of technology innovation centres set up by the UK government to help the development and commercialisation of technologies in sectors that are strategically important to the UK. And so, as such, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult engages with offshore wind innovators and wave and tidal innovators. I'm personally an engineer, um, and I've been designing and uh, running innovation programmes to support wave and tidal technology development for eight or nine years or so. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Tim Hurst. I'm the Interim Director of Wave Energy Scotland. Wave Energy Scotland is a new organisation uh, recently set up by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, funded through uh, the Scottish Government. Uh, the main objectives for us are to uh, continue the development of wave technology within Scotland, uh, retain the IP of uh, wave energy companies that uh, have gone into administration, um, provide a pathway for indigenous, indigenous Scottish wave developers to take their technology through to commercialisation and to generally um, drive the, de uh, the technology development process through uh, a more collaborative um, approach to wave technology. I think that's a pretty good summary of where we are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Elaine Hanton. I jointly head up the energy team at Highlands and Islands Enterprise and over the l last four months have worked exclusively on the establishment of Wave Energy Scotland alongside Tim. Um, in my recent past with HIE, I also led the public sector group <coughs> which established uh, the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney. So I've been working on marine energy for around 15 years or so now. Thank you. Okay. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm Lindsay Leesk. I'm the Senior Policy Manager at Scottish Renewables for Offshore Renewables. So I look after our offshore wind, wave and tidal policy work. Uh, Scottish Renewables is the trade association for companies involved in renewable energy in Scotland. We represent over 300 members and we've got a very active uh, membership in marine energy. Uh, I personally am a, a policy wonk, so I will leave the technical questions to our, our engineers over in the corner. OK, thank you. Stuart. Good morning, I'm Stuart Bradley. I'm the uh, Offshore Renewable Strategy Manager at the ETI in Loughborough. Uh, the ETI is a, a partnership between uh, um, 
industry and, uh, and government, and we make uh, targeted investments in specific uh, technology projects. Uh, we've um, invested in marine energy uh, technology projects since 2007. Um, and have recently published uh, some insights papers into both tidal and wave energy. I'm a marine engineer by profession, and I've worked on uh, technology introduction projects for the last 10 years. Great. Well, thank you all very much for that introduction. It's very helpful in just uh, setting the scene and also uh, making members aware of where everyone is, is coming from. Um, we'll, we'll just go into questions. I'll say two things just to, to preface that. First of all is um, I'm conscious we have... We have marine energy as our topic. Now, that falls into both wave and tidal power, where the issues might be related, but they're very distinct. And I think it's, it's I just remind members, if they would, to, to make a distinction when they're asking questions, whether we're talking about wave or tidal power or both, just so we don't get confused. Um, the second uh, preliminary point I'd make is we've got a very large panel today, and, and clearly it's not going to be practical if all six of you try and answer every single question. Uh, that's being asked. So I'd ask members if they would direct their questions perhaps initially at one panel member and if you'd like to come in and comment either to agree or disagree with something somebody else has, has said just catch my eye and I'll do my best to bring you in as, as time allows. We've got about 90 minutes uh, for this. Um, clearly um, uh, if we can have questions as uh, short and to the point as possible and responses similarly that allow us to get through the topics in the time that's uh, available to us. I wonder if I can maybe start off, and maybe I could address this first to yourself, T Tim Hurst from Wave Energy Scotland, uh, although I'd be interested to get uh, other views as well. Um, looking specifically at wave energy, you know, for the last 30 years we've been talking about this. Um, we've had you know, prototypes, uh, we've had the technology in some form for 30 years, we've been saying that this technology is 30 <laughs> years away, um, and yet we don't seem to be making much progress. In a nutshell, why haven't we got there quicker? What's been the reason for the delay? I think there's several, there's several issues there. And I think the most fundamental one is that um, wave te energy technology, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger challenge than we thought it was. It, it is a huge challenge. Um, not only do you have to create a device that's sensitive enough to capture energy from the waves, you have to create a device that um, is survivable in peak waves and that is co that's quite a challenge. Um, I think part, part of the more recent problem is that the, the way in which we've tried to stimulate the development of technology in, in wave is that we've, we've tried to push technology forward. We've tried to, um, in, by, by our own admission in the public sector, we've encouraged people to move to world's full-scale devices, to arrays, we've put funding packages in place to do that and that's resulted in us trying to push technology too far, put things in the sea before they've been fully tested. Um, and the end result is, uh, is that we failed at, uh, at the full scale. And that, that, I think the reason that, that Wave Energy Scotland has been established is, to, is so we can come back from that. We can go back to the earlier stages of the technology development process and go through that process in a more scientific and rigorous way, building up uh, reliable subsystems as we go and going through a process of verification and certification so that when we get to the point where we, we turn up at, uh, at Neil's door with a device ready to test, uh, we have done the necessary engineering uh, preparation to give us a good chance of success. So I think, I think there's okay. a, a combination of reasons why we've, we've gone the way we have. Um, it hasn't worked and we need to think again about how we do it. Okay, right. Thank you very much for that. Does anybody else want to want to add anything to to, to that list, Neil? Yes, if, if I could, I'd, I'd challenge the thirty year premise, um, if I may. Um, I, we've only really been trying this for for the last fifteen, to be brutally honest. Um, there was a lot of innovative work that was done by Stephen Salter, particularly, who really coined wave energy, put those two words together in pretty much the first the first occasion. Um, and unfortunately, the program that was then set up that was uh, quite a big initiative that was going and was then killed off um, by, frankly, a, a loss of loss of faith some years ago, um, principally by um, uh, the Westminster government. Um, and then it all went into a, into a bit of a hole. 
Now, it was only in a, probably around about the millennium when further work was done when Hans and Hans Enterprise particularly saw the opportunity that was there, that, that there was a resurgence in interest and effort. Um, and that gave rise to the support for a number of companies locally and then the creation of EMEC. And I have to say that what's, what we've seen is a, is a dramatic escalation of effort that's gone on, in, certainly in the last few years, uh, driven, I would argue, entirely by the fact that EMEC is even in existence. We have nucleated a lot of the activity, so it's taking place around Orkney. The reason that the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters leasing round was issued, was, in, I would argue, was entirely due to the fact we had the attention of everybody and marine energy was something that was possible. So I don't think we've been at it at really for 30 years, that was, that was my contention, and we have been trying pretty hard lately, um, but we need to try harder and we need to try slightly differently. Okay. One thing. Also, I um, want to highlight some of the achievements that we've had as well. It's not all been failures and disasters. We've made some uh, really significant progress over the last uh, the last few years. And just to pick up on the other point Tim made about the way that the development was stimulated, and he mentioned the way that the public sector funding was pushing towards a redevelopment when we should have maybe been a few steps previous to that. But a lot of the private sector investment was looking for that kind of speed of development as well. So it was a kind of a, the whole package was pushing us towards, I think, a redevelopment more quickly <coughs> for way than. We needed to be going. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Can, can I just follow up? I mean, just on that last point, Lindsay, that you made about money. I mean, can anybody tell me how much money has been spent cumulatively on trying to develop wave power over the last fifteen years? I might better passing that question to some of my public sector, <laughs> public sector colleagues. Um, we have figures. So we've done research of what's yeah. been invested by our companies. Um, and Renewable UK, our sister organisation, has done it by what's been invested um, at UK level as well. So our research, research shows that from our membership and the companies that uh, responded to the survey had invested over £200 million in Scotland already. And their supply chain was around 62% Scottish. Um, the Renewable UK... That is just in wave power. Oh, or sorry. That's, that's both. Sorry. Right, uh, OK. Yeah. Do you know what the figure for wave lesson. power is? Because I'm quite keen that we understand the... The the quite separately. I don't have a I don't have right. a split for for which uh, for which was wave and which was tidal. Right. Um, but ov but overall, um, the uh, the renewable UK research has also shown that for every uh, one pound of public sector investment, it's stimulated about seven pounds of private um, mm. sector investment as well. Um, so it's been a a, a really successful um, uh, rap. Um, what am I trying to say? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's really well stimulated, and the, the public right. sector money is really well stimulated, the private sector investment. Um, but in terms of overall public sector spent and wave, it's maybe probably better for, my, um, for the public sector colleagues to answer that. Okay. Uh, I guess just, just, just to add to that, I think the, the, there's clear there's a direct correlation between the public sector funding schemes that tend to exist and the rate of progression in terms of uh, technology development. Um, typically, in my experience, what we find is you typically put in around 25%, 30% of public sector money, uh, the rest is private sector money, to, to develop prototype technologies, etc. Uh, and so it's very, it's very clear that you know, the, the public sector stimulus leads to activity either in the wave tank or at EMEC. I mean, can anybody give me an answer to my question? Do, do we know how much money has got spent publicly or privately? According, according to our, our research, since 2010, nearly £51 million pounds of public money has been committed or spent in developing the sector. Um, so so that, that number feels about right, if right. you include wave and tidal. Well, that would include tidal and, as well. And also, if you look at the, the level of support that's gone into tidal projects as opposed to the technology development, so there, there's a distinction there between trying to develop the technology to get a, a proven product and build out uh, the first <laughs> projects to generate electricity. Tidal being at the latter stage, wave technology being at that technology development stage still. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand in terms of the, the public money that's gone in. You know, when are we like to see a return upon it? There is there is a figure quoted, uh, I think it's from um, uh, Stephen White. I think it's from, from your organisation of 300 million pounds uh, that you estimate would be required to take us to commercial readiness. Yep. I mean, that seems quite a chunk, quite a chunk of, of public money to go in. Presumably, it also be Private money would have to go yep. in to, to back that up. I mean, how do how do how do you arrive at three hundred million? Yep, that's right. So 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 we did a bottom up on that. Now, now that three hundred million is split, two hundred broadly for wave, about a hundred for tidal, and it includes the amount of money you have to put into building the first projects as well as the technology development. So if you like, it's to get 
wave and tidal technology to the point we are now with offshore wind, where we can see large-scale deployment, where it can make a significant contribution to, to the energy mix. Um, and so, so we've typically broken it down in those two phases. And how do we know if we give you £300 million of public money, you won't come back knocking on our door in five years' time and ask for more <laughs> and say, well, we haven't got very far with this and all the money's gone? Sure. I mean, so, I, so I guess there's an element of risk to developing all new emerging technologies, particularly a new form of energy generation technology. Um, and I suppose we'd look at the general scheme of things and say, actually, 300 million is fairly small compared to some of the other energy options that we could be creating here. Um, I think what 300 million pounds would do is to create uh, an appropriate platform and a long-term signal that actually there's significant funds and weights behind the technology development agenda and indeed the project development agenda for wave and tidal. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, Neil. I think it, sorry, 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 Elaine, you want to come in? Yes. See, the numbers you've quoted are <coughs> 51 million. That would be a right, a right, right for the technology development. But remember, on top of that, there's been the public sector investment in EMEC itself, and that's around yeah. 36 million. Yeah. Now, I should have the numbers at my fingertips. I'm sorry I don't, but we can certainly check those numbers for you and come back to the committee with a, a fuller answer. Okay. Neil, did you want to come in? Um, I'll, 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 I'll no, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Be pretty honest. I won't make it up. <laughs> make most of your time. <laughs> okay. Sure. You want to come in? Yeah, I, I do have some numbers for investments from the ETI. Okay, so uh, we've, uh, we've committed 34.2 million for marine energy. Uh, we've spent uh, 28.5 million uh, to date. Um, and of that, 6.2 million has been on wave. Okay. I'll, sorry, oh, sorry, Neil. I have remembered the point in. I was going you to make. You remembered your point. Forgive me. Um, uh, the, I, I'm struggling slightly with that number that you gave of the 52 because I, I'm just wondering how much of that is spent and how much is committed. Because one of the issues that we have certainly had is that um, quite often money has been able to be announced and then has had to be handed back at some later date right. due to programme yeah. failures. Okay. Um, I know that's certainly be, been the case with some of the, uh, the Westminster programmes, and the numbers are quite large. The, the, the MRDF, £42 million, pounds, I don't think any of it got spent. You know, there, there are a number of occasions. So I think we need to be very careful about the difference between com, um, announced and, and spent. That's all. Right. Cautious on that point. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple of hours to follow this up. Start with Dennis Robertson. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning. Uh, and maybe just come back to uh, Stephen uh, and your point. You, you, you said three million is it's not a particularly large amount of money in terms of investment uh, compared to perhaps uh, other types of um, uh, technologies moving forward. Can you maybe expand on that just just a bit for me, just so we can understand why you think it's uh, maybe a small amount of money compared to maybe other sources or other... I mean, what are you com what's your comparisons with? Sure. So, um, so the 300 million figure, um, I guess, remember, we're talking about two different sectors here, effectively, wave and tidal. Yeah. So, so let, let's just be cautious around lumping them together. Um, and, and the 300 million... I'm happy for you to separate it. If you sure. It is, is, is really a make-up of public and private sector money. And really all we did was say, well, how much money do we need to get to the point where we can confidently build out wave farms or tidal farms? Um, now, of course, uh, a, a smart government will leverage in as much private sector money as possible during that journey. Um, and and we, we would expect that typically you would get, for the first types of projects, you typically get half of that money from the private sector. So... Not by any means is anyone calling for a full lump of 300 million from, from public sector funds. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the relativity, I, th I think you know, reminding ourselves what we're trying to do here, which is create a new form of energy generation technology, 300 million pounds, yeah, it, it's, it's fairly small. Um, and, and I suppose the, the ready reckoner I always use is, is looking at the cost of building you know, a new nuclear power station or something like that. And, um, you know, we are talking gigawatts from tidal, gigawatts from wave, potentially. Um, so it's the same order of magnitude. And if you look at the costs, then 300 million isn't a huge amount in that regard. <coughs> so given, <coughs> given that um, sort of scenario you've just, you, you've just outlined, why do you think then there are perhaps, or, or is there indeed a reluctance for that investment? Or do you think that, or well, maybe it should be a different way. Has there been a reluctance in terms of investment? 
Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's always been a challenge around um, financing the sector, and I think partly what we've done is in the early days, so perhaps in the last um, five to eight years, we've perhaps asked too much of the private sector, so we've tried to get commercial too quickly, and many people have invested on the promise of returns too soon, um, and that in turn has driven perhaps a, a, a pace of development that's taken perhaps too much risk. Um, and people have been too disappointed when we've had technical failures. So I think in, in setting out you know, a, a clear runway and significant funding behind it and a long-term commitment, that will allow a sensible pace of development to take place, a proportionate level of technology risk, and also it wouldn't mean that the private sector are constantly disappointed and exiting the sector and we end up in this stop-start cycle where teams are built and then they're laid off, technology is left rusting on the key side, I think long-term solid commitment from both the private and public sector will allow us to sensibly develop the technology. Okay, that's very interesting. And any other members wish to comment on that sort of relativity of spending in, in some respects? Uh, Neil, if I may, um, just to put some context around Steve's point, the, the, the work that was done by the Carbon Trust some time ago said that 20% of the UK's electricity could be delivered from wave and tidal. The vast majority of that was going to be in, in, from Scottish waters. Um, now, 20% is comparable to what nuclear is doing in the UK at the moment. So that's the scale of the prize there for, for wave and tidal. Hinkley alone is £16 billion. The, the outfall pipe for the Hinkley power station has just been won by Costains. That's £230 million just for the outfall pipe. Hmm. So in terms of context, I think what we are talking about is small compared with major industrial generation quantities that we have to get to one day. <coughs> um, in terms, of in, in, in terms of we are looking at the development of new technologies in terms of sustainable sort of future technologies yes. um, with a, a wider benefit, not just to you know one part of, of the islands, but obviously to ensure the sustainability of energy for all part of the, the British islands. Would that be your assessment if we, if we invested that appropriate amount of money in the new technology? Uh, yes because the resource is here, and, and, and it works on several levels. One is there is the resource in Scottish waters to be harvested. Secondly, there is the technology to be developed and deployed, and the technology we need to remember is not just the machines, it's the entire process by which one goes and installs this stuff. So it'll be the vessels, the knowledge around the learning, the cabling, all of this work together. And frankly, that then gives you a product which is then saleable elsewhere around the world in, in due course. You know, if we get this right, we have then have a product we can then take around the world and already we're, we're working with a number of people all over the world who are coming to Scotland to see how to build test centres and we absolutely believe there's a massive market to get this right and then sell this around the world to everybody who's got a western facing coast and, and, and an electricity demand. I'm sure so, the members would like to come in but um, just as a point, do you have a time scale? Um, it so depends on how hard we want this. Um, but, but I mean, it, it, regardless of how hard we want it or not, I mean, well, surely, are you talking about, it depends on the investment then, it, as yes, to whether I achieve it. it. It's a function of investment, okay. it's a function, it's, there's also a technical pace, because these materials and these machines are big and complex, and we have to work out how to make them work well. Um, but there are places where this technology is, is applicable now. And we're seeing some interesting niches open up, um, for example, around the powering of uh, small sites like fish farms or in remote locations or in island communities. Yeah. And there are a number of niches. I think we've started in one location which is aiming to supply grid quality electricity first day out. And I think that's been quite a big, brave ask, which hasn't come off quite as well as we'd have liked. Mm -hmm. But there are other spaces. So I think we, we will see technical deployments of machines within three, four, five years uh, where they will actually be doing useful work. Yeah. Will they be economic and com cost competitive with grid electricity? No, they won't at the start. But they will be in some locations. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Guys? Right, I've got three members who want to come in with follow-up. Start with Lewis MacDonald. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm interested in a number of the answers we've had already uh, this morning. I think, uh, and focusing in the first instance on, 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 on wave power, I think uh, Tim Hurst said <coughs> it's proved to be a bigger challenge than we thought it was. And, and Stephen Wyatt said that in the last five to eight years, we've asked too much of the private sector and tried to commercialise too quickly. I wonder, before we look at how we go forward with this, if... if we could have some understand. You could help us to understand why that strategic uh, uh, wrong direction was taken. Why we tried too hard or too fast 
to commercialise over that period, given that, as, as Neil Kamod said, the, this has been underway since um, the millennium and um, seemed to be, at, at least at first, to be developing at a, an appropriate pace. What, what, what's, what, what's gone wrong to require a, a re-examination of the way forward for WAVE? And why? Sure. Well, let me let me kick off. Colleagues can come in, but um, I guess I guess first of all, there's there's always a, a driver for um, the the public sector to try and leverage in as much money as possible from the uh, <coughs> from from the private sector. So getting value for money for the taxpayer, effectively. So when the private sector is saying, well, actually, we can do this, um, then that clearly means that well, let let them let them try and let them invest. Um, one of the artefacts of the earlier days, so sort of thinking about sort of five to eight years ago, was there were wave companies who were floating on AIM. They did have venture capital investment, etc. And so they had to make substantive claims about their technology. And indeed, some of the early indications when we have devices in the water um, off the coast of Portugal, off the coast of Scotland, um, gave everyone confidence. Now, what we didn't expect was actually we have to fail a few times before we're successful. And so we did end up in this cycle where you know, we, we, we had private sector money coming in, we'd spend it, we'd then struggle to raise further money. And so I think that's caused us, certainly from a commercial point of view, not to have an ideal pathway to develop the technology. In terms of the establishment of EMEC as well, I think when we set out in the process of setting up EMEC as a test centre, we knew there would be failures, we knew there would be some real challenges along the way. So I think the fact that some technologies haven't come through and they haven't delivered as might have been hoped, in a way, isn't a surprise. You know, that had to happen in this technology development space. Um, and that's why EMEC was set up, so that failures could take place in a safe environment, if you like. And that's what EMEC has provided to the industry. It's allowed that independent testing, that verification, accreditation, <coughs> a, a, and amongst a whole support network, so that lessons can be learned. And the challenge for us now is to make sure we capture as many of these lessons and that we, we learn from them going forward and we don't re um, replicate them. Yeah, I would disagree with what Elena said. I mean, we've seen some, some sort of quite high-profile failures, but that, that, that isn't a complete failure. There is, there is a lot of learning, a lot of technology within uh, the previous programmes that can be taken forward. Uh, and WES is doing some, some work now to try and capture some of the knowledge from previous wave programs, some, some of that money that's been invested, uh, and try and take perhaps the subsystems, perhaps the, the experience of operating machines through into a, in, into a WIS program, into a more collaborative process, so that we can harvest some of the knowledge, because it's, 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 it, it isn't all failure. Uh, you know, with the, it's a high-profile failure at the, at the system level, but at the subsystem level, there's a lot, a lot of good learning that's gone on, and uh, we don't want to drop that ball at this particular moment. Oh. Neil, Neil, you want to come back? Uh, yes, uh, could I just clarify this piece about failure? C can we just be really clear? Um, we haven't failed to prove this works. We've just failed to make it commercial so far. Yeah. We haven't killed anybody or injured anybody. You know, we've, it's been done safely. It's been done in a, in a... We haven't had pollution incidents. It's been done in a very cautious and careful and measured way. Um, and where there have been problems, they've generally been at a component level that something has let a machine down. I think the, the risk, the, the, the failure that we have had is, as mentioned earlier, we've pushed people towards going too big too quickly. And we have to realise that most of the people who've got machines in the water are probably on the, only on their second generation of machine. Open Hydro have had, I think, seven turbines in the water. Palamas have built six machines in total. TGL have built two. Um, Aquamarine have built two. You know, we're, we're very, very early days on, on this whole development process. Um, and generally speaking, uh, the, the more often you do something, the better you get at it. And people have only really had a chance to have a couple of goes. And it's not really surprising it's not working perfectly because the sea is very unforgiving. But the, I would argue that the single biggest driver that pushed us towards an increase in scale was the means by which we rewarded success. And that was through the electricity marketing process. In other words, you could get rocks. Um, re renewable obligation certificates. You got paid a tariff, a premium tariff, for the electricity you landed, which therefore meant people sought to maximise the amount of electricity they were going to create from these first machines, rather than maximising the learning from these first machines. And that is probably the single biggest failure. We needed to have a mechanism to reward people for the success of doing what we wanted them to do, that clever thing of turning seawater into electricity. And, and unfortunately, the only mechanism we had to our hand was to charge it um, in the consumer's bills through, through a tariff on, on electricity prices. And I think that led us in, in a, into a bit of a dangerous space. I, 
I share the optimism on, on the technology, the potentials of the technology. I, I guess my question is more about the business model. And, you know, we've heard the difficulties with the business model over the recent period. And I guess the important thing for to understand is what change or what guarantee there is that the same business model failures won't recur. In other words, if there was undue optimism or undue uh, uh, ambition among some of the developers in a commercial sense and the wrong reward mechanism from government in, in terms of support, how are, how are those two factors different going forward to give us certainty about allowing that technological development? Can I, can I just come on that? That's, that is an important um, question, I think. That one, of the, one of the things that has happened with the, the public funding in the, in, in the past is that we've, we've, we've run a programme for a while, then there's been a gap, we've run another programme, it's been a slightly different programme. So developers have had to change track. They've had to change what they're doing in order to get the funding, perhaps jump forward to get some funding, perhaps <coughs> move a different direction. And that has been very disruptive in the whole technology development process. Uh, and that's one of the things we're seeking to address in WES in that we're producing a technology programme that has a continuity of funding right from the early stage concepts right through to arriving at EMEC. Uh, and for provided technologies can um, meet their technical milestones, they can continue to get funded at an appropriate level uh, to allow them to, to, to pass through the programme and to get to the point where they can commercialise. And that's one of the, the biggest issues that we've had raised when we've, when we've spoken to the sector as to what, you know, what, are, what are the problems. Continuity of funding has been, has been a big issue, and our, our, our current program aims to address that directly by providing this technology pathway right through from concept to um, pre-commercial uh, devices. And perhaps I, perhaps I can add that actually we will all be aware of the sort of the high-profile failure of uh, companies like Palamis uh, Wave Power. Actually, the, the flip side of that is it, it, can, it can be positive in the sense that you know we, we're no longer sort of held to the, the private sector sort of investment time horizons, and that means that we, we can pause for breath a little bit and take this longer-term view. Now, Tim, Tim's outlined sort of you know, Wave Energy Scotland and the, sort of the long-term commitment that makes is great, and I, I think the, the other challenge we've got is actually making sure we're pulling on absolutely every lever we've got in terms of the technology learning that we've had, the expertise that exists to draw in to that program and to other Wave developers that, that exist, and um, yeah, and that's part of the reason why the the catapult has been set up. Um, you know, it is a centre of deep technical expertise in Glasgow um, to support offshore renewables in Scotland and the broader UK. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're using every tool in the box now over the next sort of four to five years um, to, to get where we need to be. Lindsay. The sort of actions that we're proposing are actions to take to overcome these challenges in the future. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the Marine Energy Programme Board report that um, we recently uh, prepared with the industry. The Marine Energy Programme Board is a UK government's industry uh, liaison group. So we did a bit of work that, that set out seven key actions that we think need to happen. There's three of those that cover both wave and tidal, then there's separate ones for tidal, and there's a separate one for wave. And the innovation part of it that, that we've heard about recently, that's captured in there as, as actions that we need to do, so I won't um, repeat that. But the first overall um, sort of overarching action that we really think is important is the development of a kind of UK-wide strategy that really sets the scene for the development of the progress uh, for, this, for the sector over the next few years. Uh, BBG Associates did a bit of work for us looking into the supply chain to look at supply chain gaps and they, they uh, carried out a series of interviews with companies already involved in the sector, Wave and Tidal, um, companies who had been involved and had pre uh, since fallen out and those who hurt were yet to be involved and asked them what's the biggest thing that's holding you back, why aren't you getting involved in the sector or what has made you leave. Um, and the single, single biggest factor was about market conditions and market support. What they're really looking for is that long-term clarity um, of government support for the industry and for the sector um, moving forward. So that overarching strategy is the sort of thing that tackles um, those issues. The other things that are in there are exactly as Neil's highlighted. Um, we think there could be amendments to the way that revenue support is driven. Um, CFD, it seems to appear, doesn't isn't the product that we've ended up with doesn't really work for test centres, um, and I think for some of the smaller arrays as well. So thinking about something we can do there that's more akin to a, a sort of a feed-in tariff type scheme um, might be more appropriate 
uh, for the smaller developments. And the other things we've been looking at for tidal as well are these sort of, sort of performance guarantees as well. You can't, um, one of the, the, the problems being simulating the big private sector funding is they're, again, a scale of market that they're looking for. They're not particularly interested, some of them, uh, some of the uh, investors, not really interested in the couples of megawatt schemes. They want the tens of megawatt schemes. But you can't get the tens of megawatts until you've proved the smaller schemes. And the smaller schemes have got such high uh, upfront capital costs to them that it doesn't make it attractive um, to those types of investors as well. So we need to look at a way that we overcome that hurdle and the sorts of things like performance guarantees and um, availability guarantees for um, for performance for the turbines being available uh, or for the wave device being available is the sorts of things that we're looking at here. And the actual detail of those is still being worked out um, as we as we speak and we're still working on exactly how that will work in practice. But these are the kinds of things that we're we're thinking about doing because they're the real stumbling blocks, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning uh, to the witnesses. The, um, I think the phrase that Neil Kermode used a while ago was that the sea is an unforgiving environment. Um, so are markets, as uh, clearly most of the, the witnesses have, have acknowledged. Um, can I ask what impact you feel fossil fuel prices have had on the nature of investment in wave and tidal? Or do we even know yet what the impact has been? So I, I, I can start and colleagues can come in. So I, th I think you're right to highlight we don't actually know fully yet. That's still being played out. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword, actually. Um, what, what we do see is um, there's now significant um, uh, skills capacity um, existing in the oil and gas industry that's now available to bring to bear on the offshore renewable sector. So we see more availability of vessels, more availability of engineers, um, and that's positive. They, they have many of the right skill sets and toolkit that we need to solve many of the challenges this sector faces. So, so that's the positive bit. I think that clearly the, the obvious negative bit is actually energy's got a whole lot cheaper. Um, and so you know, for the short term, you know, that counterfactual, you know, the measure in which we're competing against, has, has got lower. Um, but I think we all know that fossil fuels are finite, and over the longer time horizon, I don't think that's going to be a significant issue. Yes, it's a blip. Yes, it could shake investor confidence. But equally, the, the large redundancies and zero-hours contracts we're seeing in the oil and gas industry is clearly a strong message to say, actually, we need something a bit more stable in the longer term. This, this argument of stability is important, and, and several witnesses have talked about the, the difficulty for the long-term development of a new industry uh, running according to short-term private sector uh, timescales and, and the, the argument for, for long-term. Can I even suggest permanent public sector role uh, in this industry? You know, if the public sector is necessary to uh, help bring this industry to fruition. Um, should it be seen simply as helping the industry along to the point at which the private sector can take control again and all of the profit flows into the private sector? Or should it be looking at ensuring a public sector return on the necessary public sector investment? Should we be looking at a permanent public sector role rather than simply a transitional one, given the, the necessity that uh, that, that long-term stability uh, is having in the, in the early stages? Sure. Um, so perpetuity, it's obviously a long time, and we, we're all in the game here to, um, to try and develop a commercially viable um, industry for the wave sector and indeed the tidal sector. Um, but I think the acknowledgement um, is true that actually this is a long game. Um, you know, we're, we're talking you know, five years, ten years before we can begin to get com proper, commercial, proper commercial returns in a subsidised environment. And, yeah, and then after that, it's, well, okay, what level of subsidy does this industry need? Um, yeah. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I think we can break down um, what the industry is into a couple of components because I think some of these pieces certainly could benefit <laughs> from enduring support. Um, and the main one that comes to my mind is the way the grid operates. We know there is not grid to the places where the marine resources exist. Mm -hmm. So we know we have to get grid to those places if we're going to make the most of it and if and since the resources will be enduring 
one would imagine with the, the value you can obtain from them will also endure. So that would seem to be an entirely appropriate place where um, a, the public sector could take a significant role in leading the development on those pieces. I would also argue, and I promise this is not self-interest in as much as the test centre side of things, um, I think we need to recognise that test assets are difficult and complex and have changing needs as the industry grows. But I would point out that, say, you know, the motor industry has got a, t a test centre or a number of test centres around the world for machine for their cars, and we invented those 100 years ago plus. So I, I think there will inevitably be um, a, a technical journey which will need to be embarked upon. And if we do want to make sure that the real value uh, flows back to Scotland, it has to be through the IP that's, that's created around this technology rather than purely the value of the electrons you land. So there's an awful lot to be done in that space, and I would absolutely argue that there is a, a very strong opportunity for, uh, for, for public sector enduring involvement. Can we also add to that? I think there's also an ongoing public sector role in the whole supply chain development and supply chain engagement in the sector going forward. Because you know, retaining IP and the knowledge within Scotland is one thing, but we also want to ensure that as much manufacturing um, and wider supply chain activity associated with developing and supporting the sector is kept here as is possible. So there's an ongoing role for us there as well and you know, for Scottish Enterprise and High, as Wave Energy Scotland um, really starts to operate, you know, there's a role to make sure that projects that are attracted to Scotland actually spend in Scotland and they base themselves in Scotland. So I think there's a, a, there's a role there for us as well. I wanted to ask on IP as well. Shall I deal yeah. with that now as it's, as it's come up? Yeah, um, it's come. Particularly, I guess, to, to Tim Hurst because this is about the Wave Energy Scotland. <laughs> operating model, it's, its business model. Could you um, explain a little more uh, in, in detail than the, the written submission about how IP will operate uh, within Wave Energy Scotland's model? You know, the, the, there's a certain amount which has already been acquired uh, from Planis, yes, that's that resides now with yep. Wave Energy Scotland. There'll be the development of further IP uh, one would hope and expect uh, in association yep. with other companies. Um, how how do you envisage the long-term uh, relationship developing between Wave Energy Scotland, uh, the IP that it manages, and the way in which the revenue flows from that that IP, whether it's whether it's deployed here in Scotland or by companies exporting it around the world? Okay. The, the the way we intend to deal with IP within the WISE program is that we, we will fund technology development, but we will allow <coughs> the contractor to keep the IP. And we will require them to commercialise the IP and sell it uh, within the industry. Uh, we will also require them to licence it to others at commercial rates. Sorry? We will also require them to, to, be, able to, to be willing to licence it to others at commercial rates. Um, so so that our idea is that if you come into the WISE program, you get, you get the funding, you own the IP, but you can only keep that if you do something with it. If you supply your subcomponents or whatever they are into the market to stimulate growth uh, and push us towards commercial wave devices. Um, there will be an, an, a number of clauses in the contracts that we sign that say that if you don't do that, if you don't use the IP for an, a period, it will revert to WES. If Automatically. You try and, yes, if you try and sell it, we get the first refusal to buy it. Um, and particularly if you if you don't share within the within the program, if you decide that you're going to um, develop an exclusive arrangement, for, say you're a, a subsystem supplier and you decide to uh, have some sort of exclusive arrangement with a particular wave developer, then we would claw back the IP as well. So the the aim is give the IP to the contractor and get him to use it, commercialise it and make that technology available to all within the programme. I'm interested in the um, the point you make about the first right of refusal to acquire uh, IP, which has arisen through Wave Energy Scotland's investment. Um, what do you think the attitude will be to the exercise of that right? Will Wave Energy Scotland seek proactively to acquire IP in those circumstances in order to um, gain additional benefit in the future, additional revenue which yeah. could come from licensing that to others? Or will it simply be about, um, I don't know, 
operating as a kind of transitional owner so that that, that goes back into another private Yeah, I mean, w- we would only do that in exceptional circumstances. And our, our view is that we don't want to own IP. We think IP is best kept in the private sector. Why? Um, well, it, there's, there's, a, there's a number of reasons that, I mean, if we look back at other public sector models of, of IP ownership, for instance, ITI Energy, um, there's, there's, there's been a number of attempts to, to own IP and then commercialise it, and it's, no, it's never been very successful. And just, just the management of all that IP is, is a huge workload in itself. I mean, we, we're planning to have around 50 projects running at any one time within Wave Energy Scotland, and that would be a, a huge volume of IP to manage. Um, and I, I, I can't actually see an advantage in doing that. I can't, I can't see how, I mean, apart, apart from the, the potential commercial advantage coming back to us from, from licensing that IP. If you it, can't it, see uh, an advantage in owning it, why would the private sector see an advantage in because owning the, it? Because they can commercialise it and they can sell it. And surely we can licence it, the public sector can licence it and see the, the technology deployed, uh, private sector being the operator rather yeah. than the public sector. Uh, some, there's some, also yeah, there's some al- return on the public investment. There's, there's also consideration of, of, of creating an environment that is attractive for industry to come into. Um, if they if they don't believe that they can retain the IP, they're very they're, they're very unlikely to try and join the West program. I mean, we've, we've done a bit of testing with a number of companies, uh, particularly the larger OEMs, and those are the people that we're trying to bring into the sector, uh, and. If we suggest that we are going to own the IP, because one of the models we looked at was we own the IP and we license, we license it back to you, um, there was a there was a reluctance to get involved, and I, th- I think we've got to be honest about about where we are with Wave. It's a sector that that not many people in in, in the industrial sector want to get involved in. They don't see it's a huge market, and we have to make, create a program that is attractive to them to bring them in, to get them to bring their knowledge and their technology. Uh, to develop wave technology, and I think if we create an environment that has IP arrangements that they don't like, that will discourage them from from joining the program. And I think that's that, that's that's a uh, you know that's not just my thoughts. That I, I have actually tested that with a number of organisations. I think it's fair to say that's the experience of the ITI program right. as well, where many many months were lost trying to negotiate mm. IP arrangements with the applicants um, to ITI. And many projects just weren't taken forward as a result. So we hope this way we've got the safeguards to in, pla- in place to ensure that if the private sector working with Ways doesn't um, behave in the way we wish to, then Ways can step in and it can enforce that. Um, but in the same, uh, same token, we're trying to make it attractive enough to them that they wish to take part and they wish to participate in the first place. And we're also trying to take people in from other sectors as well. Um, so it's about it's about it's a balance really. Make it attractive so that we want to participate, but ensure we've got safeguards in place to ensure we retain benefit in Scotland, and that's what we hope we've we've got. It does just seem a, an odd contrast between the former argument that uh, we can't rely on the market, we can't rely on the private sector to have consistency and long-term investment, uh, not just given current scenarios, but the unpredictable volatility of of oil prices for as long as they remain a a, a crucial signal uh, for investment. Uh, we, we can't rely on that, so we need long-term reliance on the public sector investment, and yet the public sector investment should get the lowest return. Well, you know, I think the safeguard that's in place, any IP that's created through WES, there will be a licence back to WES, a free licence, and if the pub- private sector player does not you know, do its part of the deal, if you like, to try and commercialise and take forward that technology, then WES will have the ability and the right to sub-license that to anybody else in the market. So there is that safeguard to ensure that they are operating and they are taking forward technology as we expect them to do under this contractual arrangement we'll have. Um, I say it, it's a balance. What do we need to do to make sure we get the right people in the programme, not just those who have got nowhere else to go, but the people who have got you know, skills from other sectors, experience in other sectors, which they can bring to bear and actually help us develop this technology. And that's why we've gone down the route we have. Okay, Stephen, uh, perhaps I can um, sh- sh- share some views on this. Um, I, I, I partially agree with Wes on, on this topic. I've spent a lot of time working on uh, innovation programs for Wave and Tide. I think it comes down to USPs, unique selling points. Um, I don't personally think it's necessary for 
all technology developers to own all of the IP all of the time. And all too often, IP becomes the barrier to collaboration. Um, so I think it's necessary to look quite hard at, well, which bits of the IP need to fundamentally be in the private sector to enable a key stakeholder, a key engineering company, to develop commercial revenues further down the line, which bits actually aren't that important to that journey. Um, and so I think we need to be fairly precise in our view around, well, where do we want to try and create collaboration by freeing up some of the shackles around IP? Um, and which areas do we actually recognise that, well, yeah, that's core technology. You know, at some point, this is going to be, need to be commercialised and therefore there needs to be an arrangement in place to allow this private sector company to get commercial um, revenues from it. Um, and I guess, you know, clearly if you, if you ask the private sector, would they prefer to hang on to their IP or not, they're going to say yes. But actually sometimes that becomes a bit of a bind and everyone thinks everything is valuable. So I think where's working with other sort of technology literate uh, partners need to sort of identify, well, what are the important bits? Which are the bits that really matter here? And how do we handle those? Yeah, briefly, please, uh, the, yeah. the answer to this may be a simple yes or, or more in line with my expectations, a simple no. Uh, if we've got a, a long-term interest, if Scotland has a long-term interest in seeing this whole industry prosper and develop, is there any role at all to be played for open licensing of intellectual property in this industry? Quite possibly, and I think you know, what we've set out to date is the route we've taken for the first call under We've Energy Scotland. I think we'll, we'll see how that goes, we'll see if it works, and if it's not working, if it looks at a better arrangement, then we will evolve the process and we will look at better ways of doing it. I think we want to make sure that we, le we learn lessons, as, not just from the past, but we learn lessons as we go as well, and that we are flexible in the approach to how We've Energy Scotland um, operates, and if we need to change things, change arrangements, then we'll, we'll do that. The ultimate goal he's, here is to develop technology, and if we're putting in place barriers to that, then <clears throat> we're not going to meet our objectives. And, and aggressive protection of IP could be a barrier? We think so, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, if, if I may, the, the, the parallel that keeps coming back to my mind is what happened with the chap whose name I can't remember now, but he invented the shipping container. And he cracked the whole thing and worked out the size of them, the way the doors should shut, and the way they lock on the corners, the whole bit. Um, protected the whole lot and made it freely available and in doing so made sure that everybody then used exactly the same kit because you don't have to go and invent a, a way round it yeah. so you have standardisation and that allowed the whole shipping boxes process to take off so I, I think there may be spots where we can identify there is a blocking step and by it being in public ownership and then letting and, and giving free licence to it that might be an, an unlocking element so I can see some role Okay Yes, uh, let me follow on. I have some sympathy with, with the view that... Uh, good morning, by the way. You know, Patrick expresses, I mean, the, the natural resource is, uh, is Scottish water and the technology. Uh, yes, there has to be recognition of the, the, the return on that. But uh, there's a very interesting project that the Northern Ireland government did called the TELUS project in terms of how they uh, developed mineral and are developing mineral resources with some collaboration with, with the Northern Ireland Government. I wonder if I may talk about, we're talking about wave energy and where it sits in the hierarchy of energy provision and, and as a consequence uh, where investment might flow in terms of that hierarchy. I mean, we've talked about fossil fuels and if one looks at the prediction of oil prices, whether it's Brent crude or the Economic Futures Agency, uh, there are predictions of the oil price being uh, about 120, 140 uh, dollars a barrel, which makes it attractive to suck investment there. Uh, what comparisons have been made in terms of, firstly, the technical due diligence between wave and tidal, uh, and therefore the commercial due, due diligence? I mean, we've had the, the global number, but who sits down and looks at this in terms of the overall impact of uh, investment and the ROR that uh, is anticipated by the private sector uh, investors? Who's doing that? So, so I guess one of the, um, from, from a government perspective, um, one of the initiatives that, that happens on a biannual basis at, at a UK-wide level is uh, a technology innovation needs assessment framework that looks at all of the possible forms of renewable energy generation, um, looks at the barriers to commercialisation, looks at the economics around that and the associated GVA to the UK, 
and, and that framework allows, um, allows government, and, and it's freely available, to, to compare across all of the renewable energy technologies and, and consider where to make innovation investment. Um, and clearly one of the facets on that is the timeline. So where would, where would we like to invest now for energy generation in the next few years versus where do we want to be in 10, 15 years' time? Um, so that's probably the fr a framework I'd point to that is a sensible sort of comparator to, to look across the piece. Anyone else? Tim? Yeah, no, I, 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 I'd agree with Steve. I think that's the, that's the, the main See, the reason for asking this is I've had some dialogue with a company in, in Johnson that has manufactured submersibles and has its own tank and has tested them and has had, we've had conversations with Marine Scotland and they've uh, had PhD in, a, in, in accountancy look at the numbers along with the technicians and now they're looking to do a beta test and the things are way down the road uh, I would hope um, but I don't see that being you know when we're looking at public investment saying well where do we want to you know, where are we going to get the earliest rate of return uh, and I'm not sure you know, how we can address that or who's doing it. So, so I, I guess to follow up, you know, that, that piece of analysis that the, the Tina work uh, is, is, is definitely sort of a, a good source of that sort of data. Uh, an, an observation on that sort of analysis is that actually the benefits of these technologies sometimes felt, you know, in, in fairly small pockets. So if we look at where the benefit for uh, marine energy is felt, it, it is right here in Scotland. It's, it's, on, it's on Orkney. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's here. So we, we can look at the UK-wide numbers, if you like. We can look at the European-wide numbers or the global numbers. But actually looking at where the concentration of that benefit is felt is really important too. Um, so clearly we're going to have a balance of energy technologies providing our energy mix going forward to 2050. But actually using a broad brush comparator is obviously sometimes a little bit um, challenging because there'll be certain areas that are more appropriate for certain technologies and the benefits are felt thus. But, but forgive me, just a, a last question. In, in terms of the broad brush, I mean, surely someone, you know, there has to be some, someone's little group or government looking at the technical due diligence in terms of what's going to get to the market first. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and so, I, don't, I don't believe there's been a failure, mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as Neil uh, indicated. Any new project mm -hmm. or product or service uh, will hit the you know, occasional bump. Yep. But, you know, looking at the public investment sector, I'd say, well, where are we going to get the earliest return and, and, and optimise the opportunity for Scotland sure. driving the market? And where does it lie between wave and tidal? Sure. And, and certainly from a technology perspective, I think we've got a pretty good grasp on... Where are the economics now, and where can the economics be in the future? And certainly, the, the, you know, the offshore renewable catapult is um, very much looking at well, what are, what are the innovation building blocks that are needed to get us down the cost curve? What are the deployment rates, or bring that learning that we see in other sectors? What does the shape of that curve look like? And and we're able to do that for you know wave, tidal, offshore wind, and and there is other data around for other renewable technologies and more conventional plants. So that that comparison um, can, can be done. I guess with wave energy, we look at sort of, well, actually, we're still in the proving phases of this technology, so we need to know the longer term, can we come down the cost curve? But right now, I think it's about, well, okay, can we make this technology work reliably? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Gordon McDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the challenges that faces the sector, and um, Lindsay, some of your evidence said uncertainties around longer-term market visibility has impacted investor confidence. And what I was wanting to ask about was the recent announcement by um, National Grid and Statnet about the interconnector from Norway, which my understanding originally was going to come ashore in the northeast of Scotland, which would allow the wave and tidal power to be sold on the European energy grid once it was complete, and now it's going to come ashore in Northampton. So, so what impact will this have had on your sector in, in terms of one market availability, etc.? Uh, you'll, you'll have to forgive me. I'm not an expert on on the inter on that particular interconnector actually, and and, and the impact. 
um, that it, the direct impact that that will have had. Um, but grid as a whole for this sector, for wave and for tidal, is clearly uh, it's a long running issue, and it's always been one of our our main asks. And, and no doubt you've had people here before giving evidence on grid charging and grid, uh, needs assessments, um, etc. It's uh, it's still a challenge, and it is still an issue. Um, we didn't, uh, Scottish Renewables um, didn't agree with absolutely everything that fell out of the recent project transmit process, um, but it did have some benefits. Some of the changes were definitely beneficial for renewable energy developers, so that's all about the changing the sort of locational charging regimes. Um, it did have it did have benefits, so it is disappointing to see that uh, the implementation of those changes is still head up, uh, held up in legal processes. Um, we were pleased uh, to see Ofgem um, consulting at the moment on um, looking at ways it can amend anticipatory investment. So how you can uh, make it easier to make a needs case for anticipatory investment um, for the distribution network. Um, in the case of Orkney, though, there's a very specific thing that, that some of these incremental changes, if you like, may undermine the broader uh, need for that sort of more uh, holistic change to the system and may undermine the need for a greater uh, change to the transmission system and for constantly tinkering the edges with the, the distribution work to kind of and to make it fit for purpose in the short term. I'm sure Neil will have lots of things to say about that as well. Um, so that, that specific interconnect I, uh, I couldn't tell you what direct <coughs> impact that has had on wave and tidal, but grid as a whole, um, getting clarity and understanding um, grid connection regimes and the grid charging regimes, that's incredibly important. I'm going to move on to the, the grid connection charges, but I was wanting, does MD have a view about that? Sorry, Neil. Yeah, yeah just um, it, fundamentally, um, the the fact it had a more southern landfall is less helpful than it would have been yeah. if it had been nearer to us because we've got further to go to get to it yeah. because we need to think about the grid as working in two directions yeah. it's not just a case that we it's a means for us to send energy out but it's also a means for us to bring energy in yeah. and balance the system because there'll be times when there are no waves but there's plenty of norwegian hydro yeah. so um getting the cable connector nearer to us um, is part is it was, was important would have been useful however it's not the only game in town um, and the scale of the connectivity that is um, going to be needed is going to dwarf that, that connector on its own. Um, case in point, just for context, Orkney at the moment has got connectors which allow it to su support the about 30 megawatts of demand that the, that the islands represent. The generating capacity of the islands of wave, tidal and offshore wind, which is also big, is probably in the region of four or 5,000 megawatts. So there will have to be further cables to these islands, and then you patch in Shetland, and you put it. Mm. So it would have been useful if it had been nearer to us. It's not the end of the world. It's not, but that's only the first game. There's, we need more strands in this in this tapestry. Right. The, the 2.1 billion euros that's being underwritten by UK taxpayers um, for this project would that have been better spent, invested in making connections in the north of Scotland to the islands, etc. <laughs> I, I, I would, uh, yes, I, I, I would have certainly, you know, not beat about the bush, but um, I, I, I don't know the quality of the investment decision that was taken there, so I, I can't really, I, I don't want to compare one with the other, but we do certainly need to make sure that we are looking at those sorts of investments to be made to, to um, in these areas, because quite, quite clearly the resource is there and it won't work without the wire. At, um, uh, under government underwriting support for island cables and that will go a long way to, to appease some of the concerns and we do a lot to support the marine sector as it grows on our islands. Mm. Now, bearing in mind you guys have got to sell your electricity once you get the technology right and we're in a situation in Scotland where transmission charges are substantially higher than elsewhere in the UK where subsidies apply, connection charges are more than double what they are in the south of the country and you've got a new interconnector coming in, which my understanding doesn't attract transmission <coughs> charges. Is that really uh, helpful for the renewable industry in the north of Scotland? Is the government doing enough to tackle and, and put on a more level playing field? Both UK, especially UK government, I should say. Part of, of government, I suppose I can, I can stick my neck out on this one. Um, Government clearly needs to recognise the scale of the opportunity. We, we have been arguing long and hard with Ofgem and others who have come up uh, to see us um, that the, 
that we are failing to grasp the opportunity mm. and the grid is fundamentally holding this back. Mm. Um, I start, slight contention with uh, Lindsay's point about Project Transmit. Project Transmit worked well within mainland Scotland and didn't actually get as far as the islands. It doesn't help the islands at all. Yeah. Um, and the point you made about the interconnector, you're, you're quite right. If we had an interconnector from Orkney to Norway, we wouldn't pay, <coughs> we wouldn't pay transmission charges. Mm -hmm. But if we have one to go south, we do. Yeah. I'll clarify as well, I'm also not part of government too. Whether <laughs> 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 there's any confusion. Um, yeah, I, mean, I completely agree with Neil. I mean, that was the caveat. There, there was lots in, uh, lots in Transmit that worked for some of our members and for some of the technologies. There's other bits that, that just doesn't. Um, but it was, uh, we appreciate it was a very, very long process been going on for, <laughs> yeah, for lots of years and lots of input. Um, so we were, uh, yeah, we, we welcomed the changes, some of those changes, and they were good to see. And it's a frustration that they're um, still being held up in terms of delivery. But uh, uh, by no means are we suggesting the project transmit. The outcome was perfect. Okay, thanks. And perhaps just, uh, it, it perhaps sounds obvious, but um, you know, there's a risk that people sort of look at this industry and say, well, they won't need the grid until 2020. Mm. You know, that's when the real electricity is going to happen. But actually, what we need is the confidence that we can sell electricity. And there's this backup effect where people aren't going to invest in the technology now if they don't have the certainty they can export it when they make it. Yeah, it's, it's really just following up on and, and Gordon McDonald's point. Um, and, I, and I think these are figures that, that, that many of you have um, prop forward in the past and it's there is a potential you know we use this word as potential for the, the resource is 25 percent of europe's a uh, wave and 10 percent of the tidal europe's tidal could be based here in scotland now that is saying the resources there those figures i don't think are really uh, disputed but are we saying to 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 realise that 25% of wave and 10% of tidal, we need that infrastructure? I think that's a yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's the other way around. Um, and as Neil um, yeah. often yeah. points out to me, 25% um, of nothing is still nothing. So um, it's still understanding <clears throat> that you're looking at about 18 gigawatts of, of um, the theoretical capacity uh, for wave power in Scotland. Now, nobody's suggesting you're going to be able to exploit all of that. That is just a theoretical potential. And you're yeah. looking at about 11 for tidal. So although it's 10% of Europe's um, wave, it's actually Wait, a bigger yeah. resource, and it is a bigger global resource as well. So the market for wave is, is bigger than it is for tidal around the world. Okay. All right. A uh, long lead-in time for grid investment as well. It can take a number of years. Yeah. So to have grid ready by 2020, we need to really start working on it right now. There's no, there's no time for delay here. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Richard Lyle? Question? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Can you do that? Uh, very interesting um, points, and as uh, you said earlier on, it would, uh, uh, Neil, it would take uh, £16 billion invested in uh, uh, a nuclear uh, energy, you know, new um, facility, but basically the money that that's being spent, how much would you say we'd need to invest over the next number of years in order to move this project along? I know you've had various setbacks. Uh, and every new invention, as we said earlier on, there are setbacks. But when when do you think we could get there, and how much money, more money, would we need to invest in order to ensure that we get what what we need out of this project? C could I hand that to people like Steve? Because I think they've got my, my my job is really to focus on the guys yeah. who rock up on the beach and trying to make this stuff work. So, yeah. um, but yeah. I think Steve supplies the money, and you make it work. <laughs> yeah, that's something like that. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> on a good day. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't supply the money. Um, I'd, I'd love to be able to. But, um, yeah, so in, in, ter in terms of costs, I mean, typically it costs around £10 million to take a prototype wave device to EMEC and test it, um, evaluate an iteration of the technology. So really this is a question around, well, how many options does the industry need to be creating here? You know, do, do we put all our eggs in one basket, back one technology? Well, we've, we've, we've kind of done that in the past, I guess. Um, so, you know, we, we believe that you need to have, you know, three or four technology options, you know, keep, keep a number of irons in the fire at this stage. Then eventually there may be design convergence. We may end up with all these wave co technology conversions looking the same. But right now we don't know exactly what that winning formula is going to be. So keep those alive. So 40, 50 million pounds to keep four devices in the water at EMEC. 
Now, the important thing is actually we're not necessarily chomping at the bit to build more full-scale prototypes tomorrow. What we need to be doing is learning at a reduced scale as well that actually costs a whole lot less. And typically, we look at this industry as sort of saying tenth scale, third or quarter scale, and then full scale. And those are typically orders of magnitude in terms of the funding. So what would cost you £10 million at full scale may actually only cost you £1 or £2 million, let's say a third scale or something like that, and a whole lot less in the wave tank. And so it's really a question of balance and making sure that we're sensibly proving out what we can in the wave tank, what we can at quarter scale at EMAC Nursery, and then we tentatively go into the water at full scale to really shake down the things that we couldn't have found out in the wave tank uh, or, or beyond. And so it's really a blend of portfolio of activity. Um, but to give you a flavour, it's, you know, it's £10 million per device, if you like, when they get to that stage. A whole lot cheaper before then. Um, there was also a quite an interesting, and I'll come back to Lindsay, at least you, in your submission, and you maybe want to explain this, there have been significant challenges over the last few months, leading to a reassessment of the scale and pace of development in Scotland over the near term. What do you mean by that? I think it captures most of the discussion that we've been we've been having today, um, and understanding that, um, particularly in the wave sector, the technology has not progressed at the speed that a lot of us originally in, envisaged it has been, um, and, and that has caused us all to step back and reassess uh, and put into place other schemes to make up for that and to um, adapt to it likewise, and just how quickly we're going to be able to to move to the sort of scale of industry that we all want and we all want to see. So basically, what, what we're saying this morning is we have um, something which has a potential that, you know, is uh, infinite. And, you know, ba basically we're going to, you know, we could, we could make loads and lo loads of uh, technology advances, money, etc., sell it all over the world. Uh, uh, but basically it's, we're just so far away, is that what we're basically saying, Neil? We're, we're, we're just so far away from it, but it's going to, as and when it happens, uh, everything will fall into place. Yeah, uh, th 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 there's, there's a lot of truth in that. We have... I keep coming back to a parallel that somebody gave me a long time ago about the aviation industry. Um, and the point is that we are quite close to, I would argue, we are quite close in wave and tidal to where, um, certainly wave industry, uh, to where the Wright brothers were when they got heavier than air flight working for the first time. Now, at that point, people have been trying to aviate for hundreds and hundreds of years, and eventually they got it right. Now, the fundamental principles that the Wright brothers used in terms of the, the lift and the, the controlling processes are in every aircraft that flies today. So they got it, they got bits of it right, but you certainly wouldn't regard um, the, the right flyer as a commercial aircraft now. But they, the Wrights did actually sell their second and their third aircraft, and that then led to a whole, um, whole industry being created. Now, there are, there are energy changes le levels that happen within that, largely driven by wars and strategic imperatives to actually go and get this sorted out. So um, we can actually escalate... But we need to be able to escalate the scale of this when we are technically ready and when the need is here. Now, the need is becoming more pressing as we've just passed 400 parts per million carbon dioxide for the first time in human history this, um, a few weeks ago. Um, the pressing need is definitely there, but the technology is not quite right yet. So I think Steve's point about us making sure that we innovate and develop at a scale we can afford get good at what we can do at this scale and then be ready to really blossom when we get this absolutely right. That's the critical thing. Uh, and I would draw a, a parallel that, go, that happened where we really got it badly wrong in, in Orkney um, with wind in the past. We had a test centre in Orkney uh, at Burger Hill. We had the most innovative wind turbines around. We went for a jump from a 300 kilowatt machine to a 3 megawatt machine, and there were some technical issues with it. It worked, it was fine, but, it, but people just weren't quite comfortable with it. And as a result of that, we then gave up our wind industry. Mm. The Danes, on the other hand, stayed with it, and it, the, it's been a huge success. And now we've passed the 3 megawatt mark, and now we're heading towards as an 8 megawatt turbine just gone up, so it, and, it's, and it's heading onwards. But we stalled. 
and we stalled because we, we pushed a little bit too hard and too fast at a critical moment. And I think we need to get really good at what we're doing, use the technologies and use the facilities we've got to really make sure we, we understand this and then build out when we are ready. Don't force people to go to the water too early. <coughs> so basically my last comment through you, Katina, would be stick with us. We've got to do it. And, 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 and if you do stick with us, um, we'll ensure that we do it. I had written the word patience on the bottom of my pad before I came in today. So that was something we actually need. We need, we need a degree of impatient patience. We need to keep pushing, but we absolutely need to not, not be unreasonable and go, oh, that's it, you know, and walk away. The, the creation of Wales, I think, was a brilliant move. I absolutely do. It, at a time of threat, Scotland stood up and said, we're not having this, and, and stepped towards the threat. And I think that was exactly the right thing to do. We could have stepped back and gone, oh, it's all a bit hard, really. But we didn't. And, and I think that's why it's, it's such an innovative process and we need to support it. We've got to ride this through because the win is so huge, it will be criminal not to do it. Thank you. Okay. Lindsay. I think this is um, taking the convener's tip here, um, one where we really need to differentiate between wave and tidal still. So we were kind of talking in generics there, and, w and wave is further behind. But when we're looking at tidal, we're talking about, you're asking about being so far away. We've got to remember we've got Maygen that's just reached financial mm. close, mm. and you've got Nova Innovation doing fantastic things up in Shetland. You are looking at your first small arrays, but your first arrays coming to fruition in the tidal sector. Um, so the idea that it's so far away, I don't think is so true for, for tidal. <coughs> we've made in a different place, as we've all acknowledged this morning. Okay. Um, I'll take brief, very brief supplementary, first of all, from Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Kamina. Just uh, in relation to Neil Kermode, uh, your comparison with aviation, uh, you, you said that the urgency was there, but you gave the example that war, for example, had been an imperative, uh, spurring the, the, the development of the, the early industry <laughs> forward. You talked about the, the urgency of climate change, and that's clearly understood. We're not yet seeing anything close to the same imperative that a war would have delivered in terms of, of aviation development. What's, what's needed to turn that, that scientific recognition of urgency into the political imperative that's necessary to spur this industry in the way that you've uh, outlined happened with aviation? <laughs> it's not an easy one, I know. No, thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, I think we've got to recognise that the the, the, uh, the the real risk is that we de we say we have to get wave energy going, we've got to do it tomorrow, and it's a desperate rush, and we'll rush out there and, and not be prepared for it. We, we we have got to get this technology right, because I fundamentally believe, so I'm spending my life doing this, um, that this is a technology that will deliver benefits, um, but it will deliver benefits when we are ready to go and do it. Um, we can only ever prepare... Uh, the equipment and get things organised and learn how to optimise this and therefore do it at the lowest possible cost um, in the expectation that there will be deployment. Now, the point that was made earlier was that setting the market conditions means that people will focus on this and continue to drive and develop and, and be ready for the opportunity when it opens up. Can government trigger that opportunity? It can trigger it to some extent by, by demand. It could, it could choose to um, uh, buy, uh, to set a market for, for wave energy. We could say we will buy umpteen gigawatts of wave energy, first one ready, bring it on. You know, there are a number of things that could be done in that sort of space. Um, but there isn't really one very, very clear picture. Um, I, I, think, I think we've seen that renewables works. We're seeing that it, it generates jobs. There's 250, 300 people working in Orkney today on this sector. It is, it is very, very real um, uh, where we are. And we know that this can be, can be delivered. But it is about having the patience to get the technology right, rather than going off and doing this thing and going off half-cocked. The timescale for decommissioning fossil fuels might focus the mind. Could well be. Commitment and the support we've had, um, political support we've had in Scotland, exemplified by the establishment of Wave Energy Scotland, allows us to do exactly what Neil's set out is set out just now. It allows us to take that breath, pause, look at what we've done right, look at the things that clearly led, we aren't going to lead anywhere successful. We put them aside, and allows us to take that step by step, rigorous engineering approach now to developing the components and subsystems, and doing it in a competitive way so that we take forward a small number hopefully, of the technologies which at the end of the day the private sector will step back in and they will help us commercialise and you know, 
create generation around the Scottish coastline. And I think this is ex exactly the approach we, we need now. Um, and we are satisfied that the budget we have available to us is, is appropriate for the work that's ahead of us in terms of Wave Energy Scotland and that earlier stage prototype and <coughs> technology development. All right. Another brief supplementary. The, 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 the Ernst Young report in September 2016 showed the UK had been downgraded to seventh for renewable sector investment by default, particularly new products. I, I mean, what, what do you believe? I'm going to ask you where you think Scotland fits in, but is that lack of innovation? Are we too risk averse? Has it been the EMR or lack of? I mean, what do we need to do to? I mean, we talk about patience, and we need to get things right. You know, what is happening elsewhere that uh, is managing? You know, what countries are managing leapfrog uh, the, the UK in terms of this sector investment? Tim, sorry. sorry. No, I, 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 it's to say that um, investment in wave energy across the world is has reduced. It's not just ha just a case that that's happening in Scotland. So when when we talk about investment in renewables, I think I think. Wave is a separate case, and, and we certainly have seen a significant change. Not not just a reduction in the in the amount of investment in, in wave technology, but almost a complete drying up of investment in wave technology. And if I if I go back to to January of last year, when the first minister had his, his wave summit on uh, wave technology to look at the reasons why um, investment had dried up in wave technology, it was quite clear by the industry representatives that turned up on that day that. It was all about the technology, and their, their view was get the technology to work and we'll come back to the table and we'll reinvest. And that was a strong message across the, the whole of the, uh, the committee that, that sat on that uh, Wave Summit that day. Um, and I think that, that is a big stimulus as to why Wave Energy Scotland has been set up, because that, that's exactly our role, get the technology to work. Um, and I think that's, that, that's, the, that's what we should do. We should put all our efforts into getting the technology to work. Um, and investment will come back in, undoubtedly. And do we have a feel for international Lynch. competition? All right, sorry, Lindsay. Sorry. Lindsay. Sorry. Lindsay. I think the, the specific reason um, in the Ernst & Young report was around EMR, um, so it was sort of the renewable sector as a whole, and that has been a big shift for us to understand the EMR regime coming in and to get our heads around a new contract for difference regime. And as Neil and I were both saying earlier on, I actually don't think at the moment it's had too much of a direct <laughs> impact on this sector, there's some really sort of technical stuff in there that, that has been challenging in terms of scale of market. Um, but I think we've got to a point now where we've realised that product doesn't necessarily work for the very early stage technologies. We need to amend something in there as well. Like I say, something akin to a feed-in tariff for our very uh, for the first small-scale arrays and for the test centres is probably more appropriate than trying to um, play into the CFD regime at the moment. But I think that was the underlying reason behind the, the Ernst & Young report. So in this technology, we know where we are internationally in terms of competitiveness, in, in terms of development of the technology. We, we, we absolutely do. Um, the, the, an awful lot of the work that's been going on at EMEC has actually been international players coming in and playing uh, here, and we are continuing to attract people in who want to come and try their technology. And they want to try it in Scotland because they know there's a market. They can see the supportive environment that's going on. We are still the, sort of the pinnacle of what's going on, even though the, sort of the pyramid has sunk, slunk, sunk slightly. Um, and people are really, really keen to find a way into this. So we're, we're right in the right place for the international side of things, but it is up to us to make the most of it. And, and it's probably also, sorry. Say, it's in Steve's, um, Steve's written evidence as well. I think it's in all of our written evidence about. It. We might still be at the pinnacle just now, but the rest of the world is rapidly nipping at our heels, and it has real programs going on. Right, sure. and, and it's, and it's prob probably worth saying that actually the reason many of these international um, technology developers in the past, <coughs> visited the EMEC and, and in the broader UK, is, is public sector support um, and, and public sector commitment. People come here, frankly, because they can get support in the costs of developing their technology. Um, and I think I'd probably disagree just slightly in terms of, yeah, we are sort of level pegging with what's happening elsewhere. I mean, the, the, the example I've sort of, that keeps me awake at night a little bit is what's happening in the US and the Department for Energy in the US have got a major push on wave energy technologies just now. They're talking $100 million or so um, on a competition basis to develop technology. So, yeah, you know, th there are other things happening that we've got to be cognizant of. I think it's important to say as well that the, the DOE program is it's pretty much in line with the, the, the program that we're about to kick off as well. So it's, it, it's along the same lines, a competitive pathway for technology <laughs> development. So. Yeah.
Well, we most definitely do still have a lot of those in terms of the learning we've had. Apologies. Um, we've, we've hit the buffers first, but these other countries are going to suffer similar problems, so we've definitely got a lead there. Right, thanks. I appreciate we're getting close to the end of our time. There's two more members need to get in. Um, Joan McAlpin. Yeah, just to go straight to the back to the investment issue, we have a green investment bank in this country. I wonder if maybe Lindsay might want to say um, how much assistance have you had uh, or your members have had from the green <coughs> investment bank. Um, so the green investment bank at the moment it's it's a it's an interesting topic and a hot topic in terms of marine energy. Um, they don't invest in marine energy products at the moment, uh, marine energy uh, projects at the moment, um, and there's a real question about um, whether they should be or not. Um, energy no. not at the moment and they're a green investment bank it's to do with with <laughs> the, the way the, the bank is set up and the terms upon which they have to enter into commercial deals and not seeing it as uh, being ready for their type of investment that they're bound by through their regulations at the moment um, but we are discussing and um, in lots of discussions with them about amendments that we could be made there how we could bring green investment bank funding into the sector <laughs> and the Scottish government I have to say has been fantastic at being uh, very uh, flexible and reactive in the way that they provide support to the sector. Um, they've done that through um, the Marine Renewables Commercialisation Fund, amending that grant funding support when it needed to be. And another thing that was amended was the REEF, the Renewable Energy Investment Funds. And a lot of the changes that were made to REEF were to recognise the lack of green investment, the uh, inability of the Green Investment Bank to uh, invest into the sector at the moment. So they have tried to kind of make up for that just now. Um, I think there's, there starts to be a question about whether they could be investing in Tidal and they should be investing in Tidal soon. Um, and these are parts of the discussions we're having with them. Again, I think Waves, waves are a, a, different, a different game. Um, but we're, we certainly speak to them a lot, and, and it's, a, it's a very right. hot topic. I mean, obviously, the Green Investment Bank is a UK government initiative, and a great deal was made when it was uh, located in Scotland. Um, have you had political engagement with the people who make the decisions at UK government level about this difficulty with Green Investment Bank? Yeah, we, 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 we speak about this a lot with our, uh, with our UK colleagues and it's something that we take down to Westminster. Um, and how, what success have you had there? We're, we're getting there. I think there is definitely, um, they are interested in what we have to offer. And again, it's, it's a lot for um, the industry and the sector itself to do to prove that it's at a stage that makes it ready for that kind of investment and to play that kind of game. And, and that's what we're trying to do. It's a very uh, constructive discussion, I would say, yeah. that we're having with the bank at the moment. When the Green Investment Bank came before this committee, um, on the last occasion they revealed that only 1% of their funds was invested in Scotland. Do you think perhaps that's because of this policy regarding marine and tidal? Um, uh, n not necessarily. I wouldn't see it, I don't know how much that percentage would grow if they decided to take on um, marine in comparison to investing more in, say, offshore wind projects in Scotland, which are, would be much higher and much more significant investments and the role that would play in those kind of percentage levels. Um, like I say, we, we, we are uh, keen to keep following the discussions about um, Green Investment Bank and its relationship with the marine energy sector and specifically with the tidal sector. Mm. I think a lot of people out with the kind of the, the bubble would be very surprised to hear that, given the hype around the Green Investment Bank. Um, w would other members of the panel care to comment on that? I think probably the, the, the that sort of the, the figure you quoted in terms of how much activity goes on um, out with Scotland, I think is an artefact of the type of projects they've historically invested in. So it's, it, it's mainly been offshore renewables, mainly been offshore wind, um, and, and most of those projects that are being built and being refinanced are south of the border just now, I think what would be constructive is to be have pretty clear sight around what are the, what are the conditions, what are the criteria that could trigger an investment from, from all, in, you know, all investors, particularly the, the GIB, and that would at least set out, well, what is it that we're, we're shooting for here? And I think organisations such as mine have got an opportunity to, to work with the investment community to help us better understand, well, what, what are the conditions that these organisations would invest under? Right. Neil, have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, he, yes, I, I, and I, I did wonder whether there might be elements of what the Green Investment Bank could do that could support the underlying infrastructure, and that is that it may not be it may may not be appropriate for them, given the technical risk that might be there for uh, some of the particular projects that are there. But however, most of these projects are going to require grid behind them. And if there is some mechanism by which maybe some uh, that, that that could be brought in, or indeed in the same sort of thing about um, a, a testing infrastructure, you know, there may well be places in which they, they they might be able to meet their investment criteria, which um, 
Uh, I, I'm not a banker, so I, so I really can't comment on how, how high they've set their criteria. Yeah. I wonder what's the point of having a green investment bank in Scotland if only 1% of its funds are invested in Scotland? You're shaking your head, Tim. No, I would agree with you entirely. Um, yeah. Neil, earlier you mentioned, uh, made a comparison with Denmark in the 70s and 80s, and there's a reference to that in our SPICE briefing on today's session. Um, the sustained investment that happened in Denmark and Germany, I think, as well, in, in the 70s and 80s, is, is it a good comparison in terms of the actual money that they spent to get themselves to a place where the technology was commercial and that they became world leaders? Could we, could with the with the level of public investment, could we do that for wave and tidal here? I, I would have thought so. And if somebody wants to, has got better numbers than the ones that I've got in my head. Um, my recollection is that every year between 1993 and 2003, they put 130 million pounds into wind. So it's 1.3 billion overall. And the Danish GVA on wind last year, 1.5 billion last year. So, and I've seen figures even higher than that. So they got their money back in, in just, just a year. So um, I would have thought that that sort of approach um, would, would make a lot of sense. The other thing they also did, which something I have not seen the UK do as a whole, but I think we've, we've done something in, in Scotland, is about positively polarising the, the population towards um, this sort of investment. So they had, in Denmark they had wind guilds, which were a saving scheme that allowed people to invest, um, so basically crowdsourcing of, of their own individual wind projects, which then meant that when they had a wind turbine, a village saved enough money for a wind turbine, they wanted to build the wind turbine. And not only that, they wanted to see how their investment was doing. So it led them into a place where they, rather than trying to hide wind turbines, they were proud of what they did. And I do think there's an emotional element that we need to make the most of. You know, the UK does see itself as a maritime nation. Scotland's got a very strong maritime heritage. And I think we're not really playing a very strong uh, a game here about trying to make sure that people realise that marine energy is actually strategically important, environmentally benign, and is actually a massive opportunity for economic development for the country. And, and that, that's a piece that doesn't seem to be being played very strongly. Do you think that creating that atmosphere would actually help leverage hmm. private sector investment? Would it give the private sector more confidence if it had that level of public support? I, I'm quite sure it would. Um, and we, in, argue, in, in Orkney, we've argued quite strongly for a number of years that you know, we get a number of people come through our site and indeed come to the island. 57,000 people get off cruise liners every year and walk past two tidal turbines. Um, but we don't really have anything that really interprets that. And I think there, there is clearly an opportunity to inoculate all these people with such um, positive <laughs> messages about what's going on. Hey, it's called advertising in other forms, but you know, yeah, that's, there is a need, I think, to positively polarise people so that when, when these people get to a point when uh, their investments um, through their pension funds and all the rest of it are even considering marine, they've already got an awareness of this. Mm -hmm. Just in the way Stephen Salter joined Wave and Energy together 30 years ago and made those words fit together into a phrase, there is something to be done mentally to people now so that, it, that they are ready for this when the technology is, is, is good to go. Yeah. If I could just... Right, br briefly, please, because we are over time. Yeah. So. I mean, in, in terms of you, you mentioned the, the cost of um, uh, the Hinkley pipeline earlier. Um, obviously, in terms of sending out a very strong message, the UK has sent out a very strong message that at UK level it's backing nuclear and it's prepared to spend, invest huge amounts of money. Um, is that detrimental to investment in your industry? That, 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 that very, you know, hyping up nuclear power at UK level? I think we're in something of a shadow. That's the problem. I, I, I don't think it's it's necessarily renewables or nuclear. It's a, we, we have a problem with uh, with carbon, um, and at the moment the UK <coughs> government is rather focused on the nuclear side of things in, in the central part. But there is a lot of strong work going on in the southwest and in Pembrokeshire, and there are other areas which are very keen to make this work. So I think other places are seeing the value on it, but we don't we don't seem to have the same sort of traction. It would be um, really useful to see. Um, so ministers up seeing what is going on with marine, which we haven't managed lately. And, and, and just, just to add to that, I mean, I, I've got, got a few figures in my head that I carry around, which, you know, the Welsh Government have outlined £80 million for marine energy uh, within their budget. The South West uh, LEP, Local Enterprise Partnership, has got sort of 40 or £50 million ring fence for marine energy. So there is, there is commitment sort of south of the border, if you like. I think the challenge we've got is to make sure we're leveraging that here in Scotland and we're pulling all, all the right bits together. And that's certainly 
part of my remit as, as the catapult centre is to make sure we're doing that. That's regional, though. I mean, in terms of Westminster. Mm. That's right, and, and I think, but I think the activity is a bit <coughs> regional. For, for, for offshore renewables, for wave and tidal, the benefits are felt really quite regionally, which I think is why we see more engagement on a regional level than sometimes we do in Westminster. Yeah. Okay. Right, in John Lamont. Just very briefly, I suppose my observation is that um, across Scotland and beyond, everybody's very good at explaining what energy sources they don't like. And in fact, some of marine development has been for people arguing against onshore wind farms. Well, this would be better and this would be better. So I suppose I wonder what do you think needs to be done at every level? I, mean, I think it's come back to the point that, that Patrick makes about the urgency of war developing technologies. What do we need to do? What in the political situation do we need to do to stop arguments around energy being about what we don't like? Because people are very inconsistent. They're in favour of renewables until there's a community locally who are against them. And I think we've, we've seen that in, in the lifetime of this parliament where, you know, for example, in the Western Isles, um, an onshore development was very um, actively campaigned against. So I suppose, what do we need to do politically? And how do we get a proper understanding positively of what um, wave and tide actually offer, rather than it simply being because it's not something else and it's not near people's houses? Sure. I'll, I'll kick off. I mean, put, put simply, we need to get climate change back on the agenda. You know, um, there, there's no getting away from the fact. Onshore wind turbines, you know, if I said to you, you can put a temporary structure up that will generate electricity that will be cheaper than most fossil fuels, why aren't people jumping at that? Um, the same with wave and tidal. That, you know, in the future, that's the next onshore wind. Um, so putting climate change back on the agenda... Um, and in the shorter term, playing the arguments of security of supply and economic benefit, they're the three tools we've got, I think, to try and bring about this change in the public perception. Is there also something about a sense of community benefit of these developments as well? <coughs> that they're, they're more closely related to quite often quite fragile communities who would benefit economically from them but don't perceive that to be the case? Yeah, I, I think so. And with, with, the, with the islands, I think it's, it's really quite easy to demonstrate that link. Yeah, and if, you, if you look at a, a, a map of you know, economically fragile areas of the, of the north of Scotland and you look at offshore renewable energy resource, there's almost a perfect alignment. So if we can develop projects in those areas, then we can create economic activity exactly where we want to do it. So you know, there is a perfect match there. Our polling that we, we obviously do quite regular polling in terms of um, people's perception of renewables and their support for <coughs> against other resources, and it's consistently high. We're consistently up in the seventy plus percent, and there's consistent support for onshore winds. And exactly the point you were making, we have to remember a lot of the onshore infrastructure that we require for the wave and tidal sectors is driven um, by onshore wind development at the moment. So it's definitely the, we have getting that message across that it's not one or the other. The two um, um, work together is is really important. And as the trade association, we we do a lot lot to try and, and get those uh, messages out there but I think what we could really do at the moment that I keep coming back to this uh, UK-wide overarching strategic um, plan for the sector over the next few years pooling um, and working with our uh, colleagues at Westminster as well to develop something that really sets the direction of travel and gives people confiden uh, confidence puts it back up the political agenda again and really drives us forward that's that's really crucial. Neil do you want to come back in? If, if I may, thank you, Kavita. Um, I think you're absolutely right that this is. That we don't want people running away from from another technology in order to come to this. But what we need to do is to make sure people realise that this is strategically important, that there are real jobs to be had. They are. It's a sustainable technology, um, and there's a massive export opportunity. Now we're very fortunate. It, it, I have to take Orkney as a microcosm. We've ended up with a cluster there of between 250, 300 people. It's a descending number of people at the moment, unfortunately, who are employed in marine renewables as a whole. So people in Orkney really get it. They understand that it's it's a benefit. Everybody knows somebody who's working in in, in the industry, and therefore, well, I, I, they're willing to give it a bit of a go. So I think as we need to spread the knowledge about the technologies wider, we need to make sure that we are able to point to the benefits that have been um, had so far and those benefits be continuous. 
Tim's point about sporadic funding is a problem. So we need to make sure it's continuous. So far we've seen um, Methyl uh, built the Aquamarine machine, uh, the Leith, Leith constructed the Palamas machine, um, there's the blades for the Nova things built in, in Shetland, um, Port Glasgow building the Nortricity device. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but generally they're one-off events and then they go away again. So people are brought up and then disappointed. We need to get rid of the disappointment elements about it. So I think sustained activity and realising this is, you know, Scotland's Apollo program. You know, that, that's what we've, we've got to get people behind this and realise that everybody's contributing to something that's bigger than themselves. And I think that will help ride through some of these hiccups that we've had. You know, like the pothole we've stepped in at the moment with, with what's happening with Palamas. It's not a cliff we've fallen off. It's just a just a blip in the road. OK. All right, Lewis. Yeah, thanks very much. I just wondered if we could get on the record a couple of factual things about Wave Energy Scotland just while we're, while we're here and we have that opportunity. Um, it's been said um, that the uh, uh, industry has had some track record of funds being committed and not spent. Um, so just to establish <laughs> the initial budget of Wave Energy Scotland, how much of that is funds previously committed and then not spent because of companies going out of business are ceasing to operate in the same way uh, and, and um, <clears throat> also the, it would be helpful to understand the value and nature <coughs> of the contract with the former Palamas staff at Wave Energy Scotland and finally um, back to our, our previous line of questioning, the, given that Wave Energy Scotland does not aspire to hold IP in perpetuity, what is to become of the IP acquired from Palamas? On the budget point first, um, this is not recycled money from MRCA for waters or anything like that. This is money from the Scottish Government's energy budget, budget for last year and for this year that's committed. Uh, so it is new money. Um, on the, the second point, sorry, forgive me. What, yes, uh, the value and uh, nature of the contract with the former cool, Palamas. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a contract worth £226,000. That's with a group of 15 ex ex Palamas employees. And that's around capturing the knowledge and documenting as much as possible of the lessons they have learned over the last 15 years. So what's worked, what hasn't worked, where have they actually got to in the technology, where would they have gone next, um, where have they got to in terms of certification, basically to write down as much as they've got in their heads as possible. So we've got some value to add to the IP we've acquired. And the IP that's been acquired, and actually the assets, physical assets as well, will be made available to anybody coming into the, the WES programme. So we want to use it to support the, the growth of the industry in whatever way is appropriate. So we haven't been prescriptive, but other than to say that we've got it and it's available to use and we want it to be used. Just to, Sorry. Just to add, uh, as part of that contract with uh, the ex yeah. people, we, we've looked specifically at trying to extract the, the, the best parts of the, of the technology and see which of those bits of technology can be taken forward into the West programme and developed and perhaps slotted into other technologies or developed as standalone subsystems. So it's specifically focusing on what is the value uh, over the last um, 15 years that over £90 million has been invested in that we can take from that and develop for the future. So it's, it, it, it's, it's specifically looking at the future of that technology programme. And the results of that work will be made available? Yeah, so publicly, publicly published the results of that work. And do I understand from what you've said thus far that your line of uh, accountability, your line of management, uh, essentially is to the two, is to HIE specifically? That's right. And yes. that you will be audited as part of the HIE? Okay. As I yeah, so WES has been set up as a, subs as a subsidiary, subsidiary of HIE. Yeah. It mm -hmm. will operate under HIE's operating and governance framework and HIE's chief executive is the accountable officer. So all of HIE's reporting and monitoring and other um, system and frameworks will all apply to Wave Energy Scotland. Wave Energy Scotland will report to the, the High Board on progress and yep. thereby back to Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government. And, and, and that remit is specifically and exclusively for Wave Energy, yes. Tidal Energy, you will continue to support in other ways. That's right, yes. Yep. Um, and, and finally, Convener, if I may, the, the, a lot of what we've heard um, has been very positive about <coughs> Tidal Energy, that it's close to First of May, that uh, uh, some of the issues that we've heard about with wave energy have not arisen at this stage. Can I just, and Lindsay was very positive, I wonder if, if, if other panel members would confirm that you are equally confident that the development of tidal energy as distinct from wave is at the point um, where moving forward to commercialisation is realistic and where some of the issues around running before you walk that have hit 
wave energy are not going to get in the way at this at this critical stage. Yeah, I think we would absolutely agree with the, the points that have been made. Um, with the Moodem <coughs> project, it's now started onshore works and offshore drilling. They're looking to start deployment from next year and have all, the, all four devices in the water by 2017 and, and commissioned. So th that's not to say there won't be further technical challenges and hitches and a lot more learning to be had. But yeah, we think we, we do agree that t uh, tidal sector is at a different stage and is that bit further, further forward. And I guess it's because it's more of a known technology. Um, industrialists understand it. You know, there's been design convergence, which there hasn't been in the wave sector, and that's made a, a massive difference. Can I just apologise on behalf of Tim and I for both of our phones, so please accept our apologies. Stephen, <coughs> <coughs> you want to come in? Perhaps, perhaps just uh, some, some thoughts on tidal. I, mean, I, I don't think we're, we're home and dry uh, in, in terms of tidal energy. We, we, we do have the first uh, project that's reached FID. We're starting to do some of the land works around that. There's a bit of way to go yet in, in, before we have energy generating. And then I think there's another step, once we've put those five devices in the water, to then configure the next phase of that that will be significantly greater. And so, um, in, in part with sort of the, the advent of Wave Energy Scotland, the ORE catapult has sort of focusing a lot, a lot harder on tidal energy, working with those that are looking to develop the projects and develop the technology to try and overcome some of those barriers looking out to sort of you know, the first project and, and beyond. So there is a bit more work to do. Thank you. And Lindsay? Just to clarify as well. I mean, I, I the, just, just wanted to make the distinction between where wave is and where, yeah. where title is. And I absolutely <coughs> agree, by no means take any of the success for granted. And it, it isn't yeah. home and dry yet. There's a long way to go. And in the MEPB report that I referred to earlier, it still has a recommendation in there for an innovation programme for title. And a lot of that's focused, um, or it suggests it should be focused on uh, cost reduction. Um, as well, so that's a, a big thing that the tidal sector is going to focus at. So it was just a distinction between the where the two are, not a suggestion that it's um, yeah, it's home and dry. Okay, okay, thank you. Can I, can I just ask one last question then on, on specifically on wave power? We talked earlier about how we're we're 15 years into this. It's now 2015. If you were to come back to this committee in 2025, what will you be telling us? Will you be telling us we are now at a stage where this is commercially viable? Or will you be coming back and saying we're still facing difficulties and we need more public money? What's your best guess? Yes, commercially viable. Commercially viable. Any any advance on commercially viable? I'm just curious that my light went on first. That was also <laughs> I was not sure what to say about that. But I'm sure. um, I think we'd be saying we'll be coming back and pointing to the successes we're having, that, that there are things going on and there are machines out there and they're working. I think we will be facing some technical challenges that will start to come home to roost after a number of years in seawater. That's in inevitable. Um, I think we will be saying we'll be wanting some money, um, but, but not in the, for the same sort of things. There'll be a variety of bits. But I think we'll also um, be able to point to a much bigger group of people to be able to show what's going on. Because <coughs> it won't just be a, a small group. It'll, it'll have achieved some critical mass by then. Okay. Stephen? Yep. Um, likewise, I agree with everything people have said. I think uh, we would be coming back to talk to you, to talk about a number of successes, but also we'd be pointing to, well, what more can we achieve here? So help us with this cost reduction journey. Let's, let's maximise the opportunity that Scotland, the UK, Europe has in, in, in the wave <coughs> energy sector. Because um, it's now really tangible, and you know we're we're there delivering. Um, Stuart, you want to add anything? I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, to hearing what the uh, the first program through Wes will will deliver. Uh, I think there's a there's a lot for us to gain from those. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with the first PTO call. Okay, well, thank you all very much. It's been a long session, uh, but you've uh, answered our questions very comprehensively. So on behalf of the committee, can I thank you all for coming along this morning. Uh, and we will now uh, go into private session and have a short suspension. <laughs>